made application for three different projects that are that are in the future. Uh, but the way the PACS funding cycle works, you need to get in the queue uh, or you're kind of frozen out. So we'd like to spend a few moments just to kind of brief you. Uh, one of these projects, the one that's up here, Gorham Road is a little further along because it's in somewhat uh, the design phase. The other projects are still conceptual at this point. Uh, but nonetheless, we'd like to kind of just introduce them to you and uh, look for your endorsement later on the agenda. Um, so that strengthens our application in front of the PACS uh, policy group that makes these funding decisions. So if it uh, pleases you, I'd love to turn it over to Dan and then, or whomever is going to take the show. I'll take it. Mike's going to do it. Would you like me to stand Yes, there? please. It'd be great. Oh, yeah. great philosophy. Technology upset. I'll work on it. Okay. We can do it. You want to answer your email before you go home tonight. I, I think a couple. Of, I think a couple of those. Oh. <laughs> they're, all, they're all from you anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Oh, council copying all messages. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, before you tonight, uh, this particular project that you have here up above is the Gorm Road project. Uh, this is a segment of road from Went Wentworth Drive. Uh, eventually, uh, it's a multi-phase project out to Payne Road. Um, the f and it, it is broken up into segments. Uh, obviously, from a, from a funding and a constructability standpoint, uh, to do the whole to do the whole stretch would be uh, would be just I impossible in a construction season, and also would probably be a little a little bit more than the than the, the motor and public could bear, I would imagine. Uh, as as it's got about a 14,000 vehicle per day uh, traffic count on it, it's a, it's a very big corridor for us. And so this, uh, the, the PACS funding that we're uh, seeking right now would take and use, uh, would go from Wentworth to uh, roughly Ridgeway, so zones, uh, zones one and two, and, uh, and, a, and a portion of, 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 uh, of, of that zone three piece as well. Um, just to back up a little bit, talking, uh, Tom was earlier mentioning about funding and other sources. I uh, wanted to step back just a second, give you a general overview on that. Uh, PAX is, is, a, is an opportunity for funding. Uh, we have also had opportunities with uh, the DOT directly as well. Um, so this is not, not, not an unusual thing for us to seek other, other funding alternatives. Some recent examples where we've received either PACS or DOT funding are the two phases of uh, Pleasant Hill Road. Uh, there has been uh, some substantial funding that was uh, awarded to us for uh, Beach Ridge Road and also Spurwink Roads. So this is, uh, this, is, this is something we've done in the past. And so the, the overall scope of the project is, is uh, the complete streets piece that, uh, that you folks, uh, the policy that was endorsed here in the last council meeting, as well as roadway, road reconstruction. And so uh, that's, that's the overall scope of the project. And um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's where we're headed with it. Uh, it would be, the, the project itself would consist of uh, road, road uh, reconstruction and also vertical alignment uh, when you get Further down into by Cumberland Way, you notice that there's some uh, uh, some road work that could be done to, to cut sections of the road out as well as as elevate sections as well, uh, which would make the road uh, travel much better. Um, with working with Dan and Angela, we've uh, identified a number of um, pedestrian improvements as well, and that has also been done with two two public outreach meetings to date. Uh, where that have been very well attended as well, and I know that some of the counselors were there and uh, appreciate their attendance too. So um, that's kind of the overview of the project itself. Um, I'll let uh, Dan. Do you have anything you want to add to it? The only thing I would add, just on on the funding um, discussion, is in addition to the the other DOT sources. Um, we, we did get safe routes, routes to school funding from DOT for a number of years ago and it's been sort of in the queue waiting for us to get to this design point and Angela and I just met um, yesterday with DOT to kind of bring them up to speed on where our project is at and their, 
likely able to provide the funding for the um, the sidewalk slash bike path that's envisioned from Wentworth um, to Sawyer Road as part of the project. So another source of funding that kind of goes into the mix to, to make this project a reality so that within that segment of road, the town, hopefully PACs, maybe DOT, MPI money, different DOT money would be focused on the actual road and drainage improvements while the Safe Routes to School money can likely fund the entire um, bike pedestrian facility that's proposed along a storm road in that area. So, I was just going to guess add that this is a little different than the other two applications. This one is for funding for 2017 and as they mentioned we're a little farther ahead with this with the preliminary um, engineering started in the public process. And um, so this is a little bit different mechanism that, that PACS uses um, and so that funding would be available for 2017 which would align more with what Dan was talking about with safe routes. And I just pointed out because the other two are further out and it's a different kind of funding. Can you speak to the PACS uh, funding so that the public can understand the uh, pieces, the applications that are necessary and the uh, support of the town council to these funding applications, how that fits the process? Sure. Um, well, for our application, it was pretty spelled out. This one, as I said, is a little different. If we talk about in general, all three applications, um, we get um, certain credits for, for different pieces and we get ranked with the scoring. One of the prerequisites, however, is that town council endorses the applications. So they need to know that the town supports our efforts towards working towards the project. Um, that's just on the ground level just to get the um, application in and in ranked in support as a region. I, I should mention, should we be successful, and I think we will on hopefully all fronts, uh, there will be a, a further actual acceptance that, that some action um, you know, would be taken by this body or a future body depending on <coughs> when that decision is made. Um, so this is really about just making application and then we can have that conversation whether we want to accept it at a later date. So it's, it's not binding. <coughs> Correct. So the uh, acceptance represents the point in the project where we accept the money and commit to the project. Yeah, and you know, believe me, there are many, many other communities and other projects that are standing in line to have mm -hmm. access to these same funds. So it's really a function of being fair to the process that if we don't have interest, uh, we really need to release that money back into the pool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yes, there'll be future opportunities um, to accept that money mm -hmm. and, and the projects will be further along in kind of the outreach process and the design process um, so we can make some important decisions. And the funding is 2017 for sort of phase w zone one, two, and a portion of three and then more like 2019-2020 for funding uh, further out towards Payne Road? Yeah, for, for a number of reasons. One, for funding purposes, but also just from, a, from again, from the constructability standpoint, um, we're talking about that stretch of road uh, where that, that is being uh, considered for tax funding right now is at least one construction season and, and a portion of another construction season. And so um, what would happen is, so you're basically talking two construction seasons. It's my experience that that's about all that a, a corridor can take before you need to go away from it for a period of time. And so, uh, you know, we would go in that, and, and I have other projects in the queue. Uh, one of them being that, that East Grand Fine Point area and that sort of thing. So we might move down there if we were available, go down there for a year or two and then come back and finish a third phase and get another get another round of funding that way. So and, and, it, and these are these these projects are also lined up in in my in, in public works in five year plan uh, and have been for a number of years. So it, it's it's also kind of scheduled out that way as well. Uh, questions? Chris? Yeah, um, so a couple quick questions and forgive my naivete on this. I assume th that there's a, a general budget for these zones already done and this is a 
making a percentage of that, or do we get the appropriations first, then we do the go out to bid, determine how much the budget is there, type of situation? We put a, there, there, is, there is a preliminary budget in, in place for this uh, for this project all the way down through to so at point one. Yeah. So three point one million at this point is the uh, is the preliminary budget. And again there's uh, a tax piece which is about two hundred thousand. Safe schools uh for the safe schools which is three probably three fifty for this section. And then also beyond that, uh, we I'll, I will be submitting Angela and I will be submitting on Friday uh, a, a uh, an application to the DOT for additional funding through their municipal partnership initiative program, and that program is is available. That that one will pay half of a half the cost of a project up to five hundred thousand dollars. That's the cap. Um, so as an example, uh, Pleasant Hill Road, uh, which was just recently done, that was done with MPI funds. That was done in two seasons, two consecutive seasons, and so we're eligible for two different funding cycles there. <coughs> Um, and so there's an opportunity here for at least uh, one funding cycle, depending on how it breaks with, with constructability pieces. It's probably going to end up being two, two cycles, maybe once all said and done. Just, just to be clear, the only authorized appropriated monies are for design, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. When he says budget, we're working with engineers and starting to scope out the project. These are the preliminary yeah. overall budget numbers, but they've not received authorization from this council. Uh, yeah, that, that's okay. I just wanted to see if we, if it's in, you know, what the proportion is of <coughs> other funds in relation to the project. And one other quick question, if I could just yeah. quick follow up. Um, Dan, the, the, the safe route for schools, mm -hmm. is that money earmarked <coughs> only for the bike path, pedestrian path, if we choose, or could we use it somewhere else and still be, have that funding accessible? Yeah, it's, it's only for bike and pedestrian facilities, and okay. so there's um, money appropriated for the Wentworth to Sawyer corridor and, and adding a sidewalk sidewalk slash bike path there. There's also money appropriated for adding a sidewalk along the frontage of Oak Hill Plaza from basically Walgreens to Hannaford Drive where one doesn't exist today. So overall that money is, I think it's about $560,000 um, and we think 350, 400 would go towards action that would marry up with the project Mike's talking about. Peter, Peter's on the transportation committee, so they have reviewed this. Gives us the opportunity to hear from our representative also on that. You can certainly speak to the transportation committee review. But any questions, feel free to. <laughs> Yeah, no, they, you guys have done a great job. The only question I had is, what, at this point in time, as we start thinking about the budget process, what will be the ask in the budget for the next calendar year, do you think, for this project? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be, the, it's gonna be the, um, the estimated number, which is the 3.1. Oh, so you, it would be the whole, yeah. I haven't had a chance to have any conversation or input in that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But okay. we're sensitive to how it comes out to you, but it also has to make sense from a construction point of view, right? And right. I think okay. we're just now getting some of that information in terms of the logical phasing and such. So is the process uh, frequently <coughs> that if the project cost is X and we have some uh, ancillary sources, whatever they are, the net amount is then sought for a capital budget of approval in that year, and then the drawdown occurs as the money is needed. Correct. So that you don't take any more than what is actually used. Okay. John? So um, this ties around, I think, into kind of a bigger issue, or bigger um, perspective that I'm looking for. Do we have a master plan that details out the next 10 years these projects and what the sources of funding are and the obligations that are expected by the town. Because my understanding of PACs, having served on PACs, is that while they may give us $500,000, for some reason this, this project, something, uh, there's something coming to my head, but um, there's an expected contribution. So when the town supports it and accepts it, we're really saying we're willing to contribute funding for it because PACs is not the sole source of that. Mm -hmm. So have we been able to plan out the next 10 years and you know whether it's in the funding year or whether it's the total project doesn't matter to me how it's presented. 
um, I think it would be easier to understand based upon the project because you can understand that things can happen over different cycles. Um, I think would help understanding what the needs are globally or community-wide um, as we plan because there's going to be other critical things coming forward. I mean, we're talking about uh, the Eastern Trail. There's already rumors around educational funding. I mean, so having a longer perspective in detail, even if it's a summary, you know, um, spreadsheet, it gives us that helps me in a financial kind of mind. Um, I got a couple other questions. The big question is, especially in this year, um, when you think about some of the big residential projects that are coming up, I know latent property will feed mm -hmm. out into this. You know, the what is it, 100 units that's going in, kind of behind that. And there's other. Um, how far do you guys look out as far as your transportation needs and the improvements? Do you go out 10 years um, based upon what you know is going to be the projects coming forward? I mean, or are you limited in um, only looking out four or five years? Kind of like I remember when school planning, the state said, well, you can't go out 20 years and try to project what you really want. You can only go out so many years. What are our limitations and have we taken into consideration those things? From, from an infrastructure standpoint, I mean, I, I plan out, I'm always planning out further further than five years, but what's written down on, on a spreadsheet and, and presented to presented for budget consideration and for, for people's yeah. information is a, is a five-year plan that has a narrative to it. Um, and, then, and then, you know, uh, beyond that, uh, I'm always always thinking about it, but five, five years is a pretty, pretty solid, pretty, pretty solid laid out plan for me and then beyond that it's, it's subject to uh, funding but also what, what happens with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with with the land as you said and, and what projects come forward and that sort of thing. Well, so if I'm understanding correctly the, the, the plan would be to move forward get started sometime next summer uh, and then for the that construction period, bleed into the next construction period, take some time off, and then come back. Do we have a, an estimate on how long we think the whole project would would take? We come back and then be. So we're already talking five years out at that point. I would assume. Well, I mean, we we would go two two years two years of construction starting uh, probably preliminary. We we, we, would, we would finish design and that sort of thing next year. Uh, it would be the spring of 17, still, still, still the FY17 season. Um, so 17, 18, 18, 19 for the two phases. Uh, we will be back. We will be back to do uh, the final phases in 2021. I see, but we would still make the whole budget appropriation in this coming, or, or that would be spread out the 3.1. First two phases. Yeah. So it, if we go forward uh, with this project, then the uh, decision to include it in the capital budget would be made in this fiscal year budget mm -hmm. being developed and which would begin June, July 1st of 2016, fiscal year end June 30, 2017. Right. Fiscal work wouldn't start until spring of 17, but it's at the tail end of this next fiscal year, yes. Peter, anything from the Transportation Committee's review of these projects that's worth adding to the mix? No, I think, you know, I think, you know, we've had <coughs> lots of discussions, a lot of detailed discussions, a lot of great input. I think people are generally supportive, certainly tremendous support for the first phases of it. I think it's less clear as you get toward the later phases what that looks like and some of the other things, especially around what does that mean for bike paths and those types of things. But, but clearly there's there's a lot of support that the, I think they describe it as sort of that through zone three mm -hmm. um, makes a lot of sense and a lot of great conversation. Right. And you look at the concentration of residential development, oh. it really takes you to that limit of, of zone three, and then it gets questionable in terms of yeah. what are the points of interest and the destinations uh, beyond that. My house. <laughs> I'm quite sure I can say with confidence we won't be building a sidewalk or bike path uh, <laughs> that far. <laughs> People have already beaded a path to her door, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, was there any consideration in the design for the Layton Farm, the 100 units going in there? I mean, what, when doing the study for the design of it, how, how, what 
kind of input did you guys look at that traffic studies, all these existing traffic studies? Did you project out <coughs> five, ten years or something like that? I mean, what's the, the duration of the design viability, I guess, for lack of a better word, if that makes sense? Uh, I don't have the traffic study memorized from Leighton Farm, but I do know that the majority, if not the vast majority, of direct traffic impacts were more towards Route 1, given its proximity more towards Route 1 than Gorham Road. Mm -hmm. That being said, Maple Avenue and connecting roads will be used, certainly to get there heading um, north and west. But based on the planning board review of that project, <coughs> Um, there wasn't a warrant for additional intersection improvements around Gorham Road and Maple, mm -hmm. and there actually there wasn't at Route 1 and uh, Green Acres, which is obviously outside the scope of this. So this design effort was more about drainage improvements, roadway um, design, pedestrian bike improvements, and not so much about needing to add more capacity at intersections. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the one area that, again, is in a later phase that does need attention in terms of making sure the intersection is adequate and is, is designed properly is around eight corners. That's in phase four to five. Um, and not a lot of time was spent on the details of that, but we have time to kind of dedicate to that given how far out it is. Um, <coughs> and, you know, there was discussion around the certainly the, the Quinton, Gorham Road intersection, school traffic intersection, how to make sure that's <laughs> operating safely in kind of a managed way. So there's some in design improvements around that that's, that are kind of focused on kind of safety and, and turning movements, but not so much adding turn lanes and that kind of thing. So this isn't so much a capacity. Gorham Road has a fair amount of capacity, has a lot of volume, but it has a fair amount of capacity. It's not so much a capacity issue, it's more of a condition of the road, bike, pedestrian, drainage project, then um, we need to add more lanes or more um, better intersections. I, and I asked for a rather specific reason. I mean, I, that's my neighborhood. I'm, I'm in the Maple Avenue neighborhood. There's really two entrances. There's the, the Green Acre side and there's the Maple Ave side. And there's a lot of cut through traffic. I know taking that turn from 114 either onto Maple <coughs> because there's no turning lane there. There's a wide shoulder, which is helpful, so you can be sitting there waiting for traffic and people can still right. get by. Mm -hmm. But if you add a bike lane or something on that right-hand side, I don't know what that's going to do to congestion. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if planning is going to review this again or if it just comes before us because it's not really in a, a new project. So I don't know if planning would look at it also. But right. I think that's kind of something to take into consideration specifically at that intersection yeah. because I don't want to be in a situation where we're creating an unsafe turn situation because of the bike lane on the right side or something like that. Jim Murray. Um, this is to do with during construction. I travel that way a lot <coughs> during the day, different times of the day when school buses are backing everything up. And, um, and I was talking to some people who live on Sawyer Road just this past week, and they're concerned about, obviously, traffic already on Sawyer and what we can do to calm that down. And I'm wondering about what, I know you've done this, but talk a little bit about when this work is being done, where are people going to detour? Because, you know, people will find places and ways to get places that will screw Happen things up. Like water. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons Squirrel Road is so critical. It's one of our only right. north-south, east-west. East-west. East-west east -west connections on this side of town. I know. Uh, so and what no have we done to plan for that? Well, because I, it's going to happen. I can't imagine we'd be looking at an outright closure for any period. There would okay. be, you know, one, one lane of traffic. Because the when, the when the bus is going through, it backs up for miles. Yeah. You know, it, it, during the school There's bus. There's no doubt it will be inconvenient. Right. It, it is <coughs> critical in artery for it not to be inconvenient to folks. But given the overall condition of the roadway, uh, and, and you know, the open ditch on the east side, it's really... Um, yeah, no, no, and I'm not saying, it need, oh yeah, no kidding, it needs to be done. But yeah. I'm just saying, planning ahead, because like, you know that people are going to, a Sawyer Road's going to become a big Well, the other thing we road. often look at is night work. I mean, that, there's a cost. Yeah, figure. well, that... It's not a good candidate because there are residents who live there, right there, so uh, it's a real, it should be a challenge for sure. Yeah. The, the, traffic, the traffic control piece, and, and this is, this is uh, it adds... 
you know, this is a, this is a fairly simple project, but the, the, the traffic control piece and the fact that we do have roads at capacity already are, are, are real challenges. Right. And the real, the, the real, the, the best, the best way to deal with it is through a, a good conference. I mean, that becomes its own, that becomes its own plan set in itself. Right. But then also, it's very important in the contract <coughs> documents that, that those expectations are spelled out. Okay. Um, and so we've become very familiar with. Uh, you know, certain within the documents, making sure there's certain work hours that are adhered to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to your point about certain times of day, right. and, and actually it gets down as granular as uh, road closures only in one direction, okay. uh, you know, and, and so forth and so on uh, at a given time of day, so that we're we're, we're leaving the most direct route, uh, Route One, is for an example. I mean, right. we, we would never do a do a double lane closure. Uh, Right. Um, the northbound in the morning or, or, or southbound in the afternoon, and those sorts of things. So that, that corporate knowledge, and also, um, you know, we, we work with the police department in terms of the other folks that are out there. They see a lot of what's going on, too, so we, we rely on them as well. So, um, yeah, tra traffic control and, and, uh, and, the, and the routing is, right. is, is a huge deal and is, is probably one. Is probably one of the more difficult pieces of, of doing these projects uh, on, these, on these main roads these days. Dan, the, uh, for the people at home who are watching and don't know about the Layton uh, project, can you describe geographically where we are and what's involved in it? So if you look up on the screen for the council and those at home, oops, <laughs> <laughs> not there, sorry. Um, it's really at the top of the screen. You see sort of to the upper right of where it says Zone 2, Sawyer to Maple, and that um, in that bubble to the, to the upper right, there's open land that's now under construction as a, as a subdivision and it's, you know, nine, 95 to 100 lots. Ultimately, right now there's, you know, 28 to, to 30. So, again, it's and certainly going to be using... How does that feed out of the neighborhood? It ties into Elmwood, mm -hmm. which ties to Maple Avenue, which also ties to Green Acres. So it has connections to both adjacent arterial roads, Route 1 being one and Gorm Road being another. Um, again, it's closer to Route 1, but there's still going to be a lot of traffic that's going to use Maple Avenue and go to the mall and, and the Walmart area and, and points north slash west. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think that probably wraps that. Are everyone satisfied? Yeah. 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 Can we ten minutes, second. Time point quickly. Yeah. Yeah. We just have two other projects that are very conceptual at this point. But uh, again, we'd like to at least get in the funding queue to see if we have any right. potential there. Mm -hmm. So, you want to just give it a yeah. quick so overview? Simply quick, quick overview. There's, there's two projects. Can you see them in the circle up there? Is that is that kind of wonky intersection that's there right now mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, seems to be confusing to a lot of people, myself included. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a uh, that that is one project, and uh, right now it's conceptual. Uh, we we've, we've looked at uh, a modified T intersection. We've looked at roundabouts. We've looked at a number of different things. That there are a number of different opportunities that would fit in there. Obviously, uh, the, the public involvement piece uh, has not happened on that one yet. It would be a huge piece of a uh, huge component of anything that we did, and so that's that's one of the uh, one of the projects that we're seeking f uh, uh, some funding on. And then also the East Grand Ave corridor uh, is, uh, by by all accounts, the, the, the drainage is uh, 50 1950s era drainage that is that is that is failing and has been happening at this time. Obviously, the sidewalk and pedestrian amenities are, are very few, and the ones that are there are in very poor condition. And then road surface again, uh, you know, that's that's a that's a piece of road that's had uh, simple overlays uh, over the years, and really nothing more than that. Um, and that is one that is that is just prime for a uh, complete streets approach to uh, to road building. I mean, it's it's, it's textbook. So uh, um, you know, that that would be uh, that would be the other piece of that. So. Um, being on the Conservation Commission, and we've been looking for a long time at potential sea level rise uh, and those impacts on infrastructure. That area, of course, is prime target for 
as we invest this money in this infrastructure on the roads, are we looking at taking that into consideration as far as elevation and whatnot? If you're going to be putting all sorts of money in there? Well, I mean, Not that you can build a, a well, yeah, raised well, road, so to speak. We but look at it, and, and, and obviously they're, they're, we, have a, we have a study here in town that, that right. we've done and, and that sort of thing. I'll be honest with you. I mean, the, the, the reality of it is with, a, with, a, with an area like that, you, you have to build to what's there. Um, right. And, and so when you've already got stuff that's at that, that, that elevation, right. it's difficult to, right. to raise a road and that sort of thing. But... Uh, you know, there are opportunities to look at when you're doing a drainage project, uh, what sorts of technologies are out there, right. um, you know, flood control gates uh, that, that we've had, simple flipper right. ends and on, on all flow. And, and I just bring it up just because I've become hyper aware of it being involved with Conservation yeah. Commission and then hey, this aerial is perfect because you see you've got a marsh and then you get the ocean, and then you've got this little strip there, and it won't take much to inundate that. Uh, in storms, forget any any type of sea level rise or whatnot. So, I'm just curious if we have any kind of uh, flood data or storm data. I mean, I know it's all that stuff's kind of getting the, this, the uh, trending is getting skewed as of late. But is there any traditional data or something we can look at in terms of? Frequency of flooding, or you know, um, washouts, yeah. or anything like that. Uh, um, you know, just something to give us a, an idea of of what type of environment that we're that we're looking at, and and if the investment is going to be that large, what what uh, mechanisms we put in place to protect that investment? Well, there's a couple of different things. I mean, there's right now FEMA's updating um, flood mapping, but that's sort of looking backwards. You know, that's yeah. not projecting, that's looking right. backwards, but it would um, make our current flood maps and current flood kind of projections current uh, versus, you know, 15 years old. Um, but there's been an ongoing kind of Saco Bay working group where we're working with the other towns on potentials for kind of sea level rise and storm events and what that looks like looking into the future. So we have that mapping that shows uh, areas that could be impacted that aren't impacted now. Um, again, their they're best guesses, their projections are based on anticipated uh, change in sea level rise and storm events, not reality necessarily, but we do have some of that information. and. I think as part of this project, probably the utility companies are going to be in here too. Mike mm -hmm. mentioned how old the drainage infrastructure is. It's also probably the age of the water and, and maybe sewer infrastructure, or at least the water infrastructure. So there's opportunities for the utilities to kind of look at their resiliency and, and make modifications um, at the same time that the town does. Um, and just to understand the timing of this one versus the one we presented, this is applying for 2019 money, and so we recognize that that's quite some time out, and we are kind of glad that it's so far out, so that we have time, as Mike said, for public process. And what was done to date is only kind of best guess on what improvements might be approved and kind of um, supported locally. It's also, we also sort of applied for the most extensive improvements, knowing that we can always back away from that. So we're asking for sort of a lot of money of PACs, knowing that we may not do everything that we kind of put on the concept plan. So I think the goal is to have over the next year and a half a um, public input process where community is involved, transportation committee is involved, the council is involved, and decisions can be made on the details. And we just needed to apply, so we get in line, basically. So we recognize that needs to come. You want to briefly address the third project? Is there a third one? The, the these two, Mike. These are the both two. Both an intersection and, and the second intersection. intersection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, Sean? So, um, and you can refresh my memory. So, it seems that there would be an advantage if it hasn't already been done. I, d I do remember not that long ago there was some um, restructuring done around on this particular map here the bridge um, that's right before Snow's Cannery, the old yeah. Snow's Cannery, there was re like it was either rebuilt or something was done. So the question I have is that it's being done. Um, have we looked at... It's going to be done. It's under construction, reconstruction yeah. right now. Right, okay. 
um, but my, so my point though is that from that point down to the intersection hasn't been looked at as far as how it can integrate because there's a lot of pedestrian and bicycle traffic and you know coming from Bailey's campground and from other areas because there's a lot of seasonal so the question I have is that is there a potential that you can look at you know where that circle the you know that encompasses kind of going up that road is that yeah. something that we could look at we're going to look at that sooner okay so we're going to have a public process around yep. that probably this spring summer because we actually yep. got additional PACS DOT money for the repaving oh, of that section so this is going to be sort of a phased like or yep. this is going to be phased where the bridge is reconstructed repaving restriping kind of re delineation of that corridor to deal with some of the things you've raised, you know, bikes and pedestrians and, and auto traffic. And that kind of sets up future projects, uh, hopefully for funded through PACs 2019 and beyond to deal with these bigger yeah. efforts that are before you. So so, this, so I like what I heard, if I understand it, and that is, um, will all of the projects include some type of community um, what, what do they call those down at Higgins Beast? Not the cohorts, but you had these little like, like a charrette or a yeah, that's that's called. Yeah. yeah, a little focus group. Because I can see that a lot of, particularly this project, having a huge amount of impact regarding residential, the mm -hmm. because of the proximity of their houses to the roadway, where on something like Gorm Road, the proximity, um, the number of houses is significantly fewer, and the proximity is much less the further back. So. Um, I just want to make sure we've incorporated kind of that charrette um, phase, the focus group phase. That's the plan. To get the bike. Oh, good. 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 Any further? Thank you. Thank you. Take the next piece. Yes, the next piece. We do have a couple of gentlemen that have joined us. Um, Johan from uh, Northeast Civil Solutions and Mr. Bannon are representing uh, Charlie Gendron, who owns property at 36. 7 King Street. It was, uh, I do have materials here I'm pleased to distribute. They were sent to you uh, as well. And as Johan takes, the, takes his place there, I'll just provide a, a bit of introduction. Um, I've been aware of this interest for about eight months or so and kind of put the brakes on it, partially due to kind of personal involvement and sensitivity to uh, this sort of request in the Pine Point area. The request is for us to discontinue um, in this case, Avenue 2. It's a portion of uh, right-of-way that was never developed and is likely never to be developed given its unique uh, configuration. It certainly it goes to the beach. Um, so I don't envision it ever being used as a roadway. Certainly it serves an important access uh, by foot from the, from the roadway of King Street down to the beach. But given the history, um, I don't think anyone on this council, uh, perhaps Council Babine did, uh, the infamous land swap yeah. on uh, <laughs> uh, Depot oh, yeah. Street so we got uh, was met with great interest um, and excitement by some. And so I'm, I'm just perhaps overly sensitive to these sorts of requests and have kind of uh, crouched this for a while. Yet it was pointed out that there's fairly uh, good precedent over the last decade. We've done exactly what they're asking on a couple of different occasions for Avenue 5 and Avenue 6. And so for that reason, after consultation with the uh, Chairman Donovan, we thought it was important for the council to at least hear the pitch, um, and we're interested in what your reaction is as to whether you're receptive for this to come forward more formally. There's no action contemplated at this point. The one final point I'll make before Johan speaks is that uh, many of you were involved in the Wellahan request. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, that was decidedly different. Uh, that involved a land swap, and it was uh, potentially enabling additional development beyond just <coughs> the development of the cottage. So I think the, the facts were materially different, and it may, uh, for that reason, it, it certainly evoked a response from the, a number of the abutters. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if this has any similar concern expressed, but I think there's some unique details that are different between the two requests. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over and just tell you we've got about 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> 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 I won't do a All right. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Johan with Dora T. Civil Solutions in Scarborough, um, and we represent Charlie Jenner and who owns this property. Um, just like Tom mentioned, uh, we have been involved in two other properties here of a discontinuous, and, and, uh, and one was with uh, Fred Bailey and Sue at Lobster Pound. 
Um, I, I will make this brief. Uh, this is a Google Earth uh, map right here, and I just wanted to show the proximity of our client's property, which is this blue line right here. This is our uh, Avenue 1, which is a uh, paved road uh, down to uh, the uh, Huntle Dune here. And over here, you have the Pine Point uh, parking lot to the beach. Okay, so we're about, uh, I don't know, three quarters, one quarter of the way this way, just to give you an idea of the project location. Okay. Um, um, one other thing I'd like to show you real quickly is there, there is a path, I can go back to this one real quickly. Um, there, is a, there is an existing path, as you can see off this area, that goes across this right in this section right okay. here. When I say it's a path, it's a little walkway through the woods. Okay. Um, and I have a couple of aerial maps from Google Earth. I'll just show those <coughs> measures. On Avenue 2, looking at this path, you can see the rural nature. It's just really woods where people walk through the woods right here. And then also there's another one here. Some people are sort of saying in this clump of woods right here. Uh, our client with this property here. So what has happened here in the course of doing this survey is our client owns this piece of property which is in green. Uh, it's a 50 foot wide strip. What happens is there was a lot of, from a, a surveying legal background, there was a lot of lotting that was going on here. And there were paper streets that were created all through this area. Um, some of these were built on, like this Avenue 1, and some were not. In this particular case, there was nothing built here. Right. Now, as of being a paper street, if nothing was really built, there's been uh, a discontinuance, and that's sort of a greater law. And in that fact, our client, in, in many discontinuances, by automatic action, already goes to the center line of the road. Okay, if you have to look for an acceptance, there was mm -hmm. never acceptance. So one way, you could say, maybe there is already been a discontinuous. But we like to clean this up because paper streets are one of those those uh, things that have been um, argued over the years in many towns. So our client owns this in green. The paper street is this this blue and yellow piece combined. So it's really almost the same width at this point. He has a very narrow lot. Um, what he liked, one of the reasons he's pursuing this is because this is that old A-frame down here and he would like to expand well with the setbacks and everything that there is. It's a very narrow lot. And and so what he would like to do is with the discontinuous, and, and Charlie lives in the neighborhood, so he, he does not want to limit the access, he does not want to change the character of this. Um, he, he's a pretty nice guy in that respect. Um, so, pretty nice. well, I, I, I say that because he's gone to the abutters, he's really tried very hard um, to talk about this. So, um, Anyway, so what he would like to do is we'd like to have this uh, discontinued, but in turn, like we did on the Bayview property, we would leave uh, like a 10 foot wide easement. And that easement, then, then the town would have an official easement on record. I mean, now you could say you may have a, an easement by prescription, means just by usage, but there is nothing formal in writing. So that's sort of what we're proposing on this. Now, I would go on to say that uh, Charlie has talked to the condo uh, next door. Uh, we had a meeting with them here and we talked to the, the, the first neighbor in particular who owns this unit and they don't seem to have any issues uh, with this at all. Okay, so um, in a nutshell, uh, that's what we're looking So just to be clear, as a practical matter, the, the to and I don't disagree, if, if should you wish to do this, I think a formal action to clarify and clear any uh, cloud on the title that may exist, uh, by function of that action, it would revert half width to the abutters. So Mr. Jenin would get what's shown in blue here, approximately half width, mm -hmm. and the other half width would go to the condominium association, the gables, uh, on the other side. And it does appear as though the existing footpath, the historical path, exists uh, exclusively on Mr. Jen Jenin's half width. So he would be in a position to grant us that easement. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming we, won't, we would like that access to remain in its current location and not relocate it. I would recommend we do that given the sensitivity of the dune areas, it's very hard to reestablish paths. I'm sorry. I have, yeah, I just have a quick question and this is just my own. <coughs> Was it in the 90s, late 90s, that the state asked for affirmative discontinuance of paper streets? 
It was actually early 90s. Was it early? Yeah, yeah, there was one that was more recent. It was, it was 70s, 60? but there was a 20 okay. year offset uh, okay. in that law. So yeah. this, then the town just did not take affirmative action to discontinue. You had, that's my question is, was the town required to take affirmative action? And if they didn't, they remained paper streets? This is just for my own. Um, Yes, the, the municipalities were required to take formal action to express interest in okay. exercising their rights to construct. Um, I've been advised, I've not done exhaustive right. legal research, but Johanna's part of their work, uh, have not been able to find any such action. Well, that would be enough. my, and, that's, and I'm, that's my assumption, that's why you're here asking about that. And so, you did answer my question, because I know when you do those affirmative discontinuances, 50% goes to one of butter and 50% goes to the yeah. other. Right. Um, <clears throat> does the town have any interest in keeping the street for any reason? And again, this is a question for the town manager. Is there any reason that the town would... Beyond would the think footpath. Yeah, beyond the footpath, beyond the, beyond the public access, which it appears that Mr. Gendron is willing to give us an easement back to preserve that. I mean, you don't see the town having any reason to say, oh yeah, at some point down the line we're going to want this as a street. I, I really don't. I don't yeah. see what public purpose would be served by constructing a public street there uh, whatsoever. That's, yeah. that's my opinion. And yeah. That's one of the reasons we're here floating the issue. Well, then just Peter. No, uh, we'll go ahead. Uh, so just for my clarification, so was it, I mean, would this be considered a town asset that would essentially be given to the abutting owners of the property? Technically. Mm -hmm. it's done all <coughs> it, yeah, if we have any rights remaining, given the history of the property, which is, right. as Tom described, uncertain as to, so it's, it's quite possible we might, before we give up an asset, we might want town's attorney to advise us on what right. the 1970s law has done to extinguish our right. rights. Right. I mean, I think that's a legitimate point. I think it also uh, uh, puts it back on the roll of taxable property right. and square footage at the beach. I've seen this at Higgins. Uh, uh, the lot is valued based on its square footage right. and it's very, very substantial. So it would probably not be an insubstantial amount of money uh, on the tax roll that it would go back. So. Just to further clarify, it's subject to verification, but all indications are both uh, abutters uh, have certainly the potential, if not, could make a strong legal argument that um, they are, that, that discontinuance has always ha already happened as a right. function of law. So essentially we've already given it. By inaction. I'm not saying that's exactly the by case. By a failure to take action to, at a certain point. to accept the roadway. Right. And, and formally assume responsibility for it as the 1970s law was written. Right. And that gave towns 20 years. So, Sean? So, um, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> having, uh, Peter, yeah, Peter had to say. Do you want to go first? No. no. You can. <laughs> so, I'm trying to Sorry. correlate um, the map you have here, which I yep. think is this the first big map here, which is in white. Yeah. And I'm trying to correlate it to the nice, uh, really dark pictured map. Um, so the question I have is then there's this round circle around something. Is that the house that's on here? Uh, yes. Okay. So I'm just trying to get a visual where that is. Sure. So, the, so I guess, the, um, so I, um, <laughs> I actually uh, got a little bit of nostalgia there because I was looking at the former discontinuances and I am actually on both of those for Avenue 5 and 6. <laughs> Notice that. I, um, and so I'm <laughs> to be consistent, even though I'm getting older my age, um, you know, I'm definitely in favor of this because it's the right thing yeah. to do. But the question I have is, as part of maybe going forward, I, I would like to hear uh, whether or not the town does have an interest because it seems that that would be a potential access to the waterfront for emergency purposes. Um, and if the town and the fire chief, police chief, and everyone is okay with that, I am too. I just, yeah. I just want to make sure that's taken into consideration um, before we just simply uh, give that up. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's important to note, although not a primary motivator, is that by turning that over, it does become taxable property for the two abutters who then acquire that. So there is a benefit of taking it off of no tax roll and putting it on. The other question I have that I would like to know is that by providing the additional um, 
um, frontage to each of the parties, does that increase their opportunity, even though they may have no intentions today, to develop and expand um, later on and pour, put multiple units on that where it might be restricted today? Because I think that should be guaranteed. They may say, well, we'll never do it, but you never know when a family changes its mind and Definitely. property changes hands over generations. You know, down the road, this based on the picture, this could fit four or five more houses while I'm being retorted. There's no frontage yeah. there. But, but, no, I'm just, right. I need to understand <laughs> what can happen. They put a driveway in. <laughs> I, guess, I guess, you know, for my, are there any other streets or, or any other circumstances yes. down there that would yeah. fall into this? So I think I would, before we make any decisions, we want to know what sort of scope. This is a kind of precedent setting. And if we do it here, what does that mean for some of the others? And then, two, I want to make sure I understand it. Did I hear you say that they do plan to expand the house on the new space? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, well, it's an A-frame that's on there right now. And when we were in there, we met on a rainy day. Yeah. Water was coming through the roof. So I think they're, they're planning on doing something with that, probably a new structure at some point. But, which, which then harkens back to the, the Wellahan conversation, too. Where so, so I just want to make sure... Before we move, we know what others' projects might fit under this rubric. Mm -hmm. And I also am concerned about making sure we do preserve access to the beach for individuals because it's getting tougher and tougher in Maine to have mm -hmm. access to okay. beach. So that access piece, I really want to understand okay. much better. And is that in for what's the word? Perpetuity. 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 <laughs> but I'm really concerned about how many others might come forth now with the same sort of request and what does that do? And I think we need to get a lot of public input before mm -hmm. we make a decision. Mm -hmm. Chris. Yeah, so I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from town council, uh, town lawyers, town council, mm -hmm. to um, advise us on what our rights actually are, uh, whether we have ceded those or not. Um, I think even though, yes, there's a certain benefit to put it on the tax rolls, it's an asset, and it's a town asset at this point until we've been told otherwise. And I think we have to go through the motions of determining the value of that and whether there's usage or not and what the fair value is and then make the decision of whether mm -hmm. it's worth um, turning it over in this person or discontinuing it and adding it to the tax roll or if there's a certain market value to it. And, and doesn't it seem as if... Uh, uh, if you're splitting up a 50-foot right-of-way, 50-foot right-of-way, yeah, 50 feet, uh, yeah. 25 to one side and 25 to the other, we really don't have uh, any input from the people on the condominium side, and so to make an arrangement with them without ever having gotten input from them seems to me right. to be odd because there there are consequences. To yeah. this. I've spoken with the president of the, of the association. association. Johan mentioned they spoke to the uh, media to butter, the one who owns the end unit. Further co communications uh, need to be had. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So there's a little bit of home uh, legwork, I think that. Yeah, I really just want to run this up the flagpole if this, you know, this is worth pursuing or yes. or send them on their way. Yep. Why don't we do do the legwork, keep the town council informed of, of mm -hmm. what is determined and uh, and we'll bring it back for, I'm very comfortable bringing it back for a further workshop yeah. uh, mm -hmm. so as to kind of creep up on this and uh, yeah. before we ever finally make a, put anything on the agenda for action. Can I make a request? Sure. Uh, Mr. Hall is mm -hmm. You could also find out uh, of the streets that are down here along Pine Point in this particular section, as Peter asked. Uh, I know when the, they were laid out by sections, Pillsbury Shores was a later development than was this area, because this, as I recall, was a turn of the century development. And <coughs> uh, the devil's in the details as to what the original development had for street extension and where they went and how we, tr again, how we treated the other ones because that would be part of the whole picture for me, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, the, those I'm looking at, I'm looking at like, uh, I can't read the names of the streets here, but, well, Tasker, what happened with Tasker, what happened with Avenue 2, what happened with, you know, all the way down the line, I'm sure if you look back at the original plans, mm -hmm. that there's, and what happened in the meantime? Historically. The other factor at work here is that uh, the uh, Higgins Beach rezoning project was well received. Uh, whether the Pine Point 
community input will lead, yeah. lead to something or nothing is unknown because uh, uh, the planning department needed a period of time to separate itself from the Higgins Beach for other work, which we've seen today with the projects on roadways. So uh, that is coming also, mm -hmm. which is information that the council doesn't have at the moment mm -hmm. as to what direction that zoning uh, and size lots and whatnot would take. So there are some issues that are clearly up in the air. Good. Great. Thank well, you. That's helpful. Thank you. I'll get yeah, working on it. Yeah, just a couple of quick notes real quick. Yeah. Um, one is that um, the, you asked about the roadway itself. There is a letter in that packet from Bergen Park where they did review it and right. look at that. Okay. So they came up with those that we don't because this thing seems it's also. You'll see that. Right. In the Good. As far as, as uh, access, I just want to make three quick points. Um, as far as access goes, there is already access one street over right here, and that's what I want to point out, mm -hmm. one street over on this side and this side. So it's not like um, we're, we're eliminating access, and right. there would still be walking. There is no way to park in this area. I mean, right. everyone probably here just walks through right. the property, right. and that would be currently it. Um, and, and Mr. Jenrin's willing to give uh, an easement. And he's willing to give an easement. Yeah, and, and then my last thing is about the condo association. I think he's met with them three or four times right. and had meetings with them. So they are very well aware. We, we, we met once here myself with them here to talk about exactly what was going on. So I think he's really uh, opened that door. And, uh, see that they, uh, and I'll re-engage them as well. Yes. To make sure. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, if you are comfortable with it, then I'll ask uh, anyone in the audience, a uh, member of the public who saw this on the agenda and would like to address it, to they have the opportunity during our uh, initial public comment period to give us their input. Okay. Good. Thank you. We're adjourned Thank for you two minutes. <laughs>